hello, and welcome back to Bumblebee, everyone. I hope you brought your big boy pants and a shoulder to cry on because today we're meeting some of the top 10 scary rulers that shocked the world. I'm gonna start in my usual fashion by choosing someone that may be familiar to all of us, such as Caligula. Roman Emperor Caligula ruled for only four years, from AD 37 to 41. When he first assumed power, he was a pretty all right guy. He allowed exiles to return to Rome, eliminated unpopular tax, and put in place some political reforms that citizens supported. But in no time, he became notoriously deranged and sadistic. The best of both worlds. He forced a political rival to take their life, made senators run in front of his chariot for miles, threw spectators into the arena to be killed by animals, forced himself upon wives and daughters of senators, and he could not keep his hands off his sister, Drusella. Once, when presiding over the sacrifice of a bull, instead of bringing the hammer down on the animal's cranium, Caligula deliberately did it to the priest's assistant. Some of his cruelties were more capricious and arbitrary in nature. He would order that the awnings providing shade for the crowds of public entertainment be pulled back at the hottest times of the day. And if he ran across a man with a thick head of hair, he'd have him seized on the spot and his scalp roughly shaven because Caligula was going bald. His reign came to an end when his own guards killed him, the first Roman emperor to die this way. Another recognizable face and name may be that of Bloody Mary, not the mirror one from the 90s sleepovers. I'm talking Mary from first of England, as in the first queen of England. She could have been remembered for that, but but instead, it's her attempts to restore Catholic-only England using convert-or-die policy that she's remembered for. Lady Jane Grey, who Mary had put to death to gain the throne, was more likable to the public. Protestants detested Mary and feared England being reclaimed in the name of Catholicism. Mary promised not to force conversion and that her upcoming marriage to the Catholic Spanish king wouldn't sway her. Womp womp, bloody b-word is a liar. A month into her ascension, Mary reaffirmed the papal jurisdiction over England, and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the heresy acts were reinstated stated, which allowed for the burning of heretics. In February of 1555, the Marian persecutions began. Sources vary, but in total, Mary I had almost 300 people executed, most of them burned at the stake. Most of them simply for the crime of being Protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years. She died in 1558, either from ovarian cysts or cancer. Next up is the toll-taking Ptolemy Philopater, one of the Greek kings of the Hellenistic Egypt, a very obvious descendant of Alexander. Alexander's pal Ptolemy. He was a 3rd century BCE pharaoh and a drunk hot mess. In true Egyptian fashion, he married his sister Arsenio and deified himself while he was still alive, promoting his family's association with Egyptian and Greek gods. In order to keep his throne secure, he did what any Ptolemy did best, kill every family member within grabbing distance. Ptolemy killed his mother, brother, and uncle with the assistance of a guy named Sobiesis, who was pals with a fellow named Agatholakes, whose sister Agatholaclea was banging Ptolemy. In addition to sneaking around with the sisters of his homies, which is not very for the boys of him, Ptolemy lounged around as if his chief concern were the idle pomp of royalty. He stopped paying attention to domestic and foreign affairs, devoting himself to shameful amours and senseless and constant drunkenness. He was compared to Dionysus, the god of drunkenness and tragedy. Neglecting his royal duties, Ptolemy even took up the pen writing a tragedy called Adonis. Unsurprisingly, it was under Ptolemy that Egypt's international presence began to wane. Next up is the Liu Song emperor gone wrong. This teenage Chinese emperor only ruled for one year in the 5th century, but what a legacy he left. Liu Ziye was the eldest son of Emperor Xiao of Liu Song during the southern and northern dynasties, and he took over the throne as Emperor Qiafin when he was 15 years old, against the wishes of his father who had died, who'd wanted Liu's younger brother, Ziluan, to ascend to the throne next. Once it was his, Liu, out of deep resentment towards said father and brother, immediately forced his brother to take his own life and killed all his other siblings. The new emperor also slaughtered all of the officials who worked for his dad and put his uncles under house arrest to avoid coups. While he's at it, he summoned his aunt to his palace to satisfy his uncommon bedroom desires and then killed his uncle when the man couldn't stand what happened to his wife. He tormented his own concubines, forced horrible situations with inanimate objects and animals, and he also had a very consensual reoccurring relation with his sister in the palace. When said sister complained it was unfair that Liu had so many concubines and she only had one husband, Liu selected several 
dozen handsome men to act as her concubines, but Liu's worst fear ends up being true. His uncles had plotted against him, and one night, almost a year to the day since he had taken the throne, Liu Ziye went to the pavilion of one of his parks at night and shot at ghosts a shaman told him were hanging around. Distracted by shooting at ghosts, he let his courtiers get close and kill him. Now, onto Nero the Nutcase. He became the Roman Emperor when he was 17, the youngest ever at that time, and it's clear Nero got his Machiavellian inclinations from his mother, who ensured his place on the throne by marrying her weird old uncle and then killing him via poison. Nero's hedonism actually continually got the best of him. In fact, he sentenced or personally killed most of his close relatives. For example, Nero slept with and killed his mother, married and death sentenced one stepsister, death sentenced his other stepsister, forced himself upon and then killed his stepbrother. He kicked his wife to death, then met a young man who looked like her, so he had the guy's boy snipped, dressed him up to look like the dead wife, and married the guy. He married another random dude, this time Nero himself playing the bride, and Nero also told Seneca, THE Seneca, to F off and take his own life, which he did. And that's just the creepy lusty stuff. In 64 AD, a great fire struck Rome, taking out 75% of the city. Many Romans blame Nero himself for the fire as a way to make room for a new castle, which he then built where half of Rome used to be. Even if he didn't start it, he did nothing to stop it, instead blaming Christians. Under his rule, thousands of Christians were starved to death, burned, torn by dogs, fed to lions, crucified, used as human torture and nailed to crosses. He was so bad that many of these Christians thought he was the Antichrist. Some regard her as a hero, but she was a through and through bigot. Isabella of Castile. There was supposed to be a little chance, little, that she would ever become a monarch of the Castiles, as she was super far removed from the direct royal lineage. Isabella is even promised to a commoner to end a rebellion. Thankfully for her, he dies before that happens. She was then wed to Ferdinand, the heir of the thrones of Castile and Aragon. And after the death of the king of Castile, Steel, the throne was given to Isabella, but there were some counterclaims and four years of battles before she is fully titled Queen of Castile. Her cruelty is recognized in the treatment of non-Christians. Her kingdom's Muslims, and especially Jewish people, were the victims of a horrible mass slaying. Her actions led to the formation of the Spanish Inquisition, known for its extreme brutality and non-Catholics, and the massive erasure of history, racial diversity, and culture worldwide. Isabella and Ferdinand then annexed the Kingdom of Grandana, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain, and the last piece to fall to the Spanish Reconquista. While some may see it as a liberation of Spain, for literally everyone else, this was the big G word, including the UN, if you look at their definition. Our next one is the formidable founder, King Leopold II, who founded the Congo Free State as his own private colony and went on to make a huge fortune from it by forcing the Congolese into heavy unpaid labor for ivory and rubber. This evil Belgian king was dubbed the Satan and Mammon in one person as he ran around kickstarting Europe's so-called scramble for Africa in 1880s. He convinced the world that his violently ceased and lucratively priced land grab in the Congo was humanitarian, telling Euro and American powers he was the only in Africa to save the poor people from the Arab people and bring Christianity to a dark continent. Effin liar! Instead, he stole about 1.1 billion to fund his lavish lifestyle and fund an array of uncomfortably young girlfriends, one of which he married when he was 74 and then died five days later. And the Congo? He turned into a massive labor force. Millions end up suffering from starvation, the birth rate dropped as men and women were separated, and tens of thousands are killed in failed rebellions. Demographers estimate that from 1880 to 1920, the population population fell by 50%. This forced labor system was then copied by French, German, and Portuguese officials. He called himself Laglium Dei, aka the Scourge of God. For Roman historian Jordanes, he was a man born into the world to shake the nations. For the Romans themselves, he was a savage destroyer, of whom it was said that the grass never grew on the spot where his horse had trod. Who was this man? Attilia of the Huns. This ruthless king of the nomadic Asiatic race killed his brother to take the throne before embarking on a campaign of slaughter and pillage through a hundred cities, which took him to the gates of Constantinople, Troyes and Gaul, and even Rome itself, threatening their empire into paying them off once a year to not be invaded by them. The Huns were interested in grabbing people, animals, loot, and land. They destroyed food sources for their enemies, and nobody was safe from their wrath, including women, elderly, priests, monks, and nuns. When marauding through Eastern Europe one day, Attila and his forces wiped 70 cities off the map. The Huns fighters were known to make blood-curdling screams 
and other noises while attacking their victims on horseback, and their favorite methods of death were impalement and crucifixion. Meeting time with our mad queen of Madagascar. Rana Valona makes it to the throne when her father warns the king of the United Tribes that someone was planning an attempt on his life. Grateful for the warning, he adopts Rana into his court one day to be the wife of his son, Prince Radama. Fast forward, the king passes in 1810 and the Prince Radama takes the throne with Rana as his queen. He allowed for an invasion on the land, especially by British missionaries who built buildings of their own and helped develop written language and forced Christian conversion naturally. These modernized ideas displeased Rana, so when her husband died and she wanted the throne, she figured, hey, these guys are kind of stupid. And by just claiming that God said she should be the queen, everyone dropped what they were doing and let her ascend to the throne. Just like that. She expelled any and all Europeans immediately and canceled trade deals with Britain and France. After one successful battle against an invasion, she stuck the missionaries' heads on spikes along the shoreline to really get the message across. She replaced the trial by jury with trial by ordeal, and those found guilty alongside with other criminals and prisoners are sold to Europeans. In 1845, Rana ordered 50,000 of her subjects to go on a buffalo hunt. With a small amount of supplies and having to build a road on their way to ease the trap as per her order. Only 10,000 of them returned, and they never caught any buffalo. Consequently, Rana's reign brought down the nation's population from 5 million to around 2.5 million by the end of her rule. On August 16th of 1861, Rana died at the age of 79 during her sleep in the palace. People mourned her death in great honor for approximately 9 months. And to take the cake is the terrifying Timur. Also known as Tamerlane, this Mongol Turkic conqueror was born in 1330. Timur became a criminal early in life, stealing goods and animals from travelers, later working as a mercenary. As a conqueror, he killed for loot, personal glory, and the dark joy that twisted up up people get from inflicting pain on others. He was the worst of the least recognized psychopaths in history, and his story provides a lesson and a warning for all of humanity. And he has a long list of horrible deeds. Dude could probably have his own top 10 video, I swear. Like the invasion of Ifshafan, which went well, and the city surrendered, but some teenage idiots decided they didn't like that and they had never done that before, so they killed a couple of Timur's men. So Timur had a city of 70,000 to about 100,000 people beheaded in response. From this moment onwards, skull towers became his operandi, and it was proven in Baghdad when 90,000 skulls were erected into 120 stinking towers throughout the city. In present day Afghanistan, Timur ordered the construction of a tower to be made out of live men, each stacked on each other, then cemented together with bricks and mortar. And as much as it's relevant for atrocities, talking about Damascus would make me sick, so let's just say his crimes in there earned him the status as an official enemy of Islam from the Muslim leaders at the time, and he was a self-proclaimed Muslim guy. This guy quite literally put the once great Sultan of the Ottoman Empire into a footstool that he would climb on to get onto his horses, and that's how we got the name for the Ottoman, the stupid little furniture piece that's impossible to place in your living room correctly. In the end, Timur's armies are estimated to have killed 17 million people, approximately 5% of the world population at the time. Thank you once again for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to learn more about some awful rulers in history, be sure to check out our channel for more.